There's this thing that movie sequels do every now and again, where they completely disregard the ending of the prior movie and essentially rewrite it in the opening in order to put the pieces in the starting places the powers that be want. A few famous examples of that would be the end of Aliens, with Ripley, Newt, Bishop and Hicks beating the alien queen, wiping out the xenomorphs and going into cryosleep as they head back home. A hopeful, satisfying ending focused on Ripley having found a surrogate family after she lost hers in the decades she was drift in space. Enter Alien 3, and during the credits, the goddamn opening credits, we learned that a facehugger had actually snuck on board, damaged the cryopods, resulting in the gruesome deaths of Newton Hicks, and impregnated Ripley with a new alien queen. The damage to the ship once again sends her off course to a penal colony this time, where she gets a brief reunion with Bishop before switching him off permanently. Uh huh, yeah, what the fuck? Or there's Terminator 2, which ends with the destruction of the Cyberdyne building and all of Dyson's research, along with the deaths of Dyson himself and the T-800, which tragically sacrifices itself in order to destroy all the remaining evidence of the Terminators and prevent their creation. Sarah closes out the movie with hope that the future is not set and they can create their own fate. Until Terminator 3, that is, which reveals that no, Skynet is this kind of cosmic inevitability. All they managed to achieve in the second film was delaying Judgment Day by a few years, and Skynet is back on their bullshit, sending a new T-model back in time. But the absolute worst culprit of this, without a doubt, is the Paul W.S. Anderson Resident Evil series. <laughs> I was always confused by these movies when I was younger, and I used to think I was the problem. You see, I saw the first film a while after it had come out, thought it was a little eh, and then never knew about or never bothered to check out the second one. I was nine when the second was released for context. But I did catch the third film on TV late one night, and little old me was absolutely flabbergasted. Why the hell is everything Mad Max now? Why is Alice psychic? Who dragged the love of my life Ardeth Bay into this shit? I assumed that I had to have missed no less than two films in the series, probably more, one of which was a detailed depiction of the downfall of global civilization, explaining where all of this came from. It wasn't until I rewatched the whole series from start to finish over Christmas, I know, festive, and also, yes, this is how long I take to make things, it wasn't until then that I realized there was only one movie that I'd missed. The explanation of the world ending is contained entirely in the third film's opening monologue, and watching the second only added to my questions. Not to mention this turned out to be the mildest instance of huge leaps and retcons between films in the series. I do think the naming of these movies is partly to blame. There's no Resident Evil 2, 3, 4 or 5. They're Apocalypse, Extinction, Afterlife and Retribution. Every one of those titles could be swapped for a different film and it would still make sense. The only ones you can trust yourself to know are in the right place, a Resident Evil no subtitle and the final chapter. Honestly, it takes some particularly weird shit to catch your eye in this series. For me to look past all of the rest of it, like Alice's never-ending supply of tactical corsets, Japanese swords and weapons that come in pairs, the bizarre slow-mo explosion reactions, and the clones. Dear lord, the clones. By the end of the series, we've seen three Reigns, three Carlosses, three Isaacses, possibly two Weskers, two Shades, two Turtle Doves, and I shit you not, a few hundred fucking Alices in various forms throughout the series. I'm just filling this bit in the script with words because I I don't know how I could possibly convey the sheer number of Alice's there are in this chunk. It's truly some Rick and Morty shit that these three characters in the same shot are all based on the same person. One being the original, another being a clone, and another being a digital copy. It's reminding me of the ending to League of Super Pets, where the scene has three separate characters interacting who are all voiced by Dwayne Johnson. It's wild to me that movies adapted from a series of games whose bread and butter is zombies resulting from engineered viruses would have the zombies as a backdrop and throwaway line or two, and instead make the series entirely about clone shenanigans. But I bring up all of this to say that the strangest thing by far in the series is how it ignores the endings of previous entries. And no, I'm not giving a spoiler warning. While that is inherent to the premise of the video, so you should be able to guess that's the case, I'm actively encouraging you not to watch six god-awful movies, and I swear 
swear it'll make just as much sense from me explaining as it would by watching them, so you may as well not bother. So here we go. The weirdness starts off mild, more of a stretch of convenience. The first film ends with Alice being taken off by Umbrella, who decide to go down into the zombie-ridden hive base to investigate. Alice wakes up in a lab slash hospital an indeterminate period of time later, having clearly been experimented on. She stumbles out the building to find Raccoon City in shambles, the zombie apocalypse kind of shambles, with no one in sight. At the beginning of the second film, as the Umbrella team inevitably get ganked by Zambos, it takes 13 hours for things to go from normal to this. It's here that Alice is woken up and emerges at what looks like twilight. The next time we see her is the same night, still plagued with memory loss, sporadic flashbacks, and crippling pain from the experiments they did on her. Then, less than 10 minutes of movie time later, she's Trinity. She's just Trinity from the Matrix. Like, no joke, she's crashing through a church window on a motorbike, jumping around on wires, and mowing down everything in sight. Now, having the superpowers is cool and all, you can guess that's a result of those experiments, and it's confirmed later, but the attitude change is jarring. Alice becomes cold as ice from this point on, and the change occurs off-screen in no more than a few hours. You might be thinking, that's not so bad, and I'd agree, but this is just easing you in for the strangeness to come. The second one ends with the city being nuked to kill all the zombies and cover up Umbrella's involvement, but our band of survivors, including Alice, Jill, Carlos, LJ and Angela helicopter out of Dodge until Alice gets hit with a flying pole defending Angela. She's found by Isaacs and taken back to Umbrella and either she died and this is a clone or she miraculously survived and they fixed her up. Either way, she breaks out, showing off that she now has psychic powers and takes off with the rest of the gang. Except psych! Isaacs actually wanted this, deliberately letting them go and activating something called Project Alice. It's heavily implied that Alice is under Umbrella's control, monitored via satellite and them able to see through her eyes, possibly a sleeper agent to take out this lot who know too much about the nuke cover-up. What a juicy stinger. I wonder what will come of this. Well, cut to three and, like I said in the intro, everything is completely different. The infection still manages to spread from Raccoon City, collapsing human civilization in a matter of months and somehow affecting the ecosystem in general, turning everything into a Mad Max desert wasteland. Once again, all five years of this is happening in the opening monologue, trying to give X-Men Origins Wolverine a run for its money. Add to that, Carlos and LJ are hanging out with a new crew, while Alice is on her own, getting into classic post-apocalypse zombie cannibal redneck torture family adventures, and Jill is nowhere to be found. It will never be explained why the group separated, and I don't know if it was ever explained what happened to Jill in the intervening time. Time. I will admit I slipped into sweet unconsciousness a couple of times in these viewings. Probably the weirdest retcon of this film is that for the majority of it, Isaacs is desperately looking for Alice. It's not clear how they lost track of her in the first place, but the opening scene shows them creating dozens of clones of Alice, trying presumably to make them as mega badass as her, and failing because they don't have the original. So why let her go at the end of the last one, you numpty? They temporarily regain control of her about two thirds of the way through the film, showing that once they get a satellite above her, they can see through her eyes again and completely shut her mind down remotely. All of this begs the question, what was the original reason for letting Alice go? What did it achieve? Was the original plan for her to act as a sleeper agent and they were just distracted by the apocalypse? If so, could they have written a line or two maybe explaining that? Well buddy, if you think that's bad, it gets much worse. Much, much worse! The third one ends with the group splitting up, this time on screen amazingly. The surviving gang fly off to arcade which definitely isn't a trap. Nope, no sir, just a perfectly safe community with plenty of food and no zombies. I haven't seen The Walking Dead. Nope, not me, no sir. Meanwhile, Alice goes off to kill Isaacs and rescues her clones along the way, threatening to come after Umbrella in Tokyo. Again, what a setup. Imagine what an entire army of super soldier Alices could do against Umbrella. And at first, it seems like for once, these movies are gonna deliver on a promise. The opening scene shows the Alice army, somehow in possession of hundreds of identical identical outfits and weapons, invading the Tokyo Umbrella facility, and massacring everyone inside in a matter of minutes. Sure, she's forgotten that she can kill people through security cameras with her mind, but you can't have everything. Wesker takes a look at the situation and nopes out of it almost immediately, escaping on a jet. Oh, this is an early win for the Alices, I was thinking. Showing off their strength so that it's all the more dramatic when Wesker comes back with the full might of Umbrella and the T-Virus and manages to give them a run for their money. Foolish me. 
I was probably drunk or something. No, Wesker detonates a bomb that mega nukes the facility, killing every single clone, every single one in the blink of an eye. Well, that was fun while it lasted. Not to worry though, the OG Alice got on the jet with him and she's gonna get revenge for her sister. Nope, he injects her with a thingy that gets rid of all of her superpowers. Yep. Now she's just an ordinary human that can still survive high-speed crashes whilst unsecured and perform acrobatic backflips on slippery surfaces. A totally normal human being. So everything that was cool and intriguing about the end of the last film is now dead and gone. And the cherry on the cake, when she finally gets there herself, Alice finds no Arcadia at the coordinates she was given. Just a rabid Claire trying desperately to become a Blue Beetle villain. This, this right here, this is where I started to lose my shit and think about writing this video. The fourth one ends with the group tracking down the actual Arcadia, an umbrella ship trapping and imprisoning survivors, killing Wesker with the same explosion that killed the Alice army, and freeing the 2,000 odd prisoners. Don't ask how the ship holds that many, spaced out in tubes like this, it's a TARDIS ship. The film ends on a note of hope, with Alice re-recording the message that led them to Arcadia in the first place, a whole colony of survivors at her back. Except, psych, this is another fake-out ending, and a veritable flock of Umbrella helicopters come for the ship, led by none other than a brainwashed Jill Valentine, who hypes up her soldiers in a mid credit scene by warning them about how difficult it will be to fight such insanely dangerous combatants as Alice and the Redfields. Okay, sweet, the fight isn't over. We're gonna go into the next film with an all-out war between Umbrella and the 2000 survivors. Well, no, the fifth one starts with everyone on the ship being immediately massacred the Redfields vanishing into thin air, and Alice herself getting taken out in less than a minute. Turns out, a fleet of armed helicopters is more than a match for a lady with a coin gun and 2,000 unarmed dizzy people. I wasn't even surprised by this one, it just washed over me at this point in the series. Once again, because originality is for gormless suckers, we cut to a confused Alice waking up in a lab to enjoy a plot about traps in an umbrella facility featuring lots and lots of clones. That story ends with the gang heading off to Washington were the last survivors of humanity. I repeat, this is it. These are the last humans alive, and they're camped out at the White House under constant assault from a horde of zombies, grumpkins, and snarks. And the survivors are led by none other than Albert Wesker, who gives Alice back her superpowers, telling her that the Red Queen is determined to wipe out humanity, and that they need to unite in order to stop her. And our five legendary heroes line up and strike their poses on the roof, ready to face the army of the dead. Okay, surely now, surely, this time, we'll get what the ending promised. What? What's that? This is the worst retcon yet? Oh great! <laughs> That's right, once again, the opening monologue of the final film retcons the entire ending of the last one. And this time, it's not even clear what actually happened. Turns out, the whole thing was a trap by Wesker. And when we start the film, the White House is completely destroyed, Alice is the only apparent survivor, and all the other main characters are MIA. But that's not all, kids, no. For the price of just one backpedal, you get not one, but two more. Wesker was also lying about the Red Queen wanting to kill all humans. She's actually trying to save them, and it's Wesker and Isaac's doing doing the exterminating. What's that? You thought everyone was already dead because the White House was the last holdout of humanity? You silly Billy, you forgot about the second backpedal. There's actually around 4,000 more survivors in other outposts, so we've still got other, less expensive side characters to hang out with during the film. This one to me is the most egregious, the most retconny, and the most disappointing of all of them. The letdown, right before the final chapter of the saga, meaning I won't even get the chance to be let down ever again, was immense. Don't get me wrong, I'll be let down in the future, like I'll never get back up again with this series. But I'll never be personally let down by Paul W.S. Anderson's inability to re-watch any of his movies. I fully believe that if this wasn't the last entry in this series of movies, it would turn out that the zombie cure was all a ploy by Wesker, and a hitherto unforeseen different colored Queen AI mutated the zombies into a new breed that are basically the same, but with a slight cosmetic change, maybe crimson heads. And it turns out that Leon and Ada survived, because those actors happened to be available at the time. And I kind of wish that's how history played out. 
But speaking of actors being available, what I'm wondering is, how the hell does this happen? All of these movies are written by Anderson with very little outside input. They're so divergent from the game's canon that there's no pressure to do things a certain way. And producers didn't give a shit about how video game movies were made until like a few years back. So surely this should be the most cohesive series ever created. So what factors are we aware of that might affect continuity? Well, the second one was directed by Alexander Witt because Anderson was busy with Aliens vs. Predator. Editor. Witt said that he'd made some small adjustments to the screenplay. Nothing major. It's pure conjecture, but maybe that resulted in some of those characterization changes in Alice that I'd mentioned. By the way, please check out the interview where he talks about this. It's drier than a nun's vag. It's the most boring thing I've ever read. Please read it. Witt is a very experienced second unit director with a mad resume of big budget pictures, and it's clear he's not the guy people usually ask questions of, and he has absolutely zero vested interest in this project. Jill didn't come back for Extinction because Sienna, I don't know how you pronounce her surname, so here it is on screen, all rainbowy and beautiful. Anyway, she was signed on for Aragon at the time, and I'm not sure what was the worst choice, honestly. This seems to be the whole reason Claire is in the movie at all, to fill a space for a video game character, but I can't see it as drastically changing the overall plot. And that's pretty much all I can see in Outside Influences. It's honestly all Anderson. This is all a result of his whims. He said before that he started writing the second one immediately after the first, which probably explains why it's the most connected of the two. No one was particularly pushing to make another one after the third, with the producers describing it as the end of the series. But these things make money, so three more, plus a reboot, plus a spin-off show. In addition, Anderson was planning to make four and five back to back, but he decided against it in the end. The major tone and setting changes for the third film, you know, turning into a Mad Max zombie film, are down to Anderson wanting to appeal to a wider movie-going audience who might not have played a Resident Evil game, but almost definitely have seen a sandy post-apocalypse neo-western. He picked the director of that one, Russell, again I'm not confident in the surname, so on screen, specifically because he liked his style. It's hard to say how planned out they were from then on, at least on the script side. Anderson said he definitely had something in mind for the rest of the series by around movie Four, but he also said that he takes it movie by movie, and that seems to be the all-consuming truth of the affair. Anderson wrote them as and when he had the green light to make another one, and given the huge amount of creative control he has on the project, he could just write whatever he felt like writing at the time. The guy moves from project to project so quickly, like just look at his schedule for that period of time. It's not exclusively Resident Evil he worked on either, he's hopping between a bunch of different properties. He doesn't sit on things, he makes a film at the speed of sound and then he moves the fuck on to the next. I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't spend a huge amount of time at the scripting stage rewriting or proofreading. I mentioned before how he was influenced by other movies and directors he enjoys, and he's certainly more inspired by films than games, despite this being a video game series. He and producer Jeremy Bolt have cited Avatar, Inception, the original Westworld, Blade Runner, and more as things Anderson loves, and you can see those films bleeding into the Resident Evil series as they come out and make a splash. It seems like whatever direction the Resident Evil series went in, it would be dictated by whatever cool movie Anderson had seen last. Anyway, now that's off my chest, I don't have to think about these movies ever again. My soul has been purified. I feel so much worse now. I didn't write an outro bit, so, um, like, subscribe, uh, do the other things, uh, more channels, UDS Gaming, UDS Music, uh, go watch them, or don't, watch more film channel stuff. Yeah, outros! It's funny I brought up Aliens and Terminator 2 in the intro, because there's this bit in the third film when Carlos blows himself up, where they just play the Terminator theme. Like, I know that's a really basic rhythm, but come on, Terminator has dibs on that. Find something else. Then there's this bit in the fifth film, where they, they just do Aliens. Like, they just take the third act of Aliens and do a shitty version of it with Resident Evil characters. The ass-kicking female lead surrogate daughter is taken by a giant monster with a weird tongue, and she goes after her despite a ticking clock that will destroy the facility they're in, forced to leave behind her love interest because he got injured. She beats down the monster in a fight and rescues the surrogate daughter by tearing open a goopy thing that's restraining her. Imagine having, like, six or seven games of content to draw from, and you shamelessly steal from Aliens instead. Wild stuff. Bye.